Oye, oye, oye. Anyone having business before the King's Justice of the Superior Court of Justice, attend now and you shall be heard. Long live the King, the Honorable Justice Hennessy presiding. You may be seated. Good morning, all. Good morning. A little housekeeping point. Um, Professor Von Gurnett was good enough to add a cast of characters at the back of the at the back of the slide deck. So I just wanted to draw that to your attention, Your Honor, in case you had not seen it yet. It it's, describes some of the names that appear regularly. This appendix A, cast of I think it's the only cast. Thank you yeah. very much. Cool. Could have said that yesterday. Very good, thank you. We, uh, I think we left off, we we're talking about, <clears throat> I believe we were talking about serving, surveying and surveying in conjunction with, with uh, you know, selling land parcels and, 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 and in conjunction with mining, do you recall that? Yes. And I think we were about to get into slide 26, which uh, appears to focus somewhat more in on mining. Yes. And we're talking about seeking and compiling data in the 1850s, yes. chapter three of your report. Uh, can you tell us about how they tracked revenue from mining? Yeah, so. Sorry, Your Honor, would you like to yeah, just hold for a second? Yeah. Thank you. So, Your Honor, you, you may recall from testimony I gave in, uh, in the first phase of these proceedings, uh, the mining licensing system. Uh, so this is a little bit of a review of that. Um, the, you may recall there was a map that was accompanying the, the Dahl Anderson report that showed the Lake Huron and Lake Superior and the little pink uh, blocks along the shorelines that showed the mining locations that were already extant in 1849. Right. And those mining locations along the North Shore in both treaties or in what later became both treaty territories had already been established under an existing system of, of licensing mining operations. And in fact, it was the fact that the government had proceeded with those licenses that in part precipitated the need for this, these treaties to begin with. So those mining locations were under these regulations that in 1846 had um, obliged uh, mining companies to pay a $600 fee to cover the cost of the surveys and, and other expenses. And at the same time, this amounted to a credit towards the first of what was understood to be five yearly installments. Mm -hmm. And the, the regulations that the, the geologists at the time had, had suggested to the government that the mining location should be a 10 square mile. And so this 10 square mile would be um, sort of two miles on the front on the lake side and then five miles in. And that would be sold at four shillings per acre. Mm -hmm which was quite a lot because when you think of how many thousands of acres that was, um, it, it had to be paid in installments. There was nobody you could afford. There's no, no company that could afford to pay it all at once and none did. Uh, so- For the amount that they were buying. Yes. Well, they were obliged to. I mean, you, there was no choice. The regulation stated that there had to be this 10, 10 square uh, right. uh, mile location at, at four shillings an acre. So the first $600 were, were it was of course 150 pounds, but I'm converting it. For, uh -huh. So that was intended to, cost, to cover the cost of the survey. 
And so we have a lot of the uh, records of this still extant in the archives, the individual uh, deposit certificates and the mining location tickets. So these were the actual uh, slips of paper that were, that were um, uh, given to the individuals or, or companies or individuals representing companies who had mining interests. So all of that needed to be uh, tracked. And so the Crown Lands Department also maintained this register uh, of these mining location tickets, which were issued to individuals. So in, at one point, you know, they, they created a spreadsheet. And then once they had that in place, they kept just adding to it. So every time there's a new mining license, they'd add to it. And so over time, uh, you could keep track of the totals uh, in the ledgers. So the very first thing that happened at the time when the first annuities came due, um, in fact, almost exactly at the same time when they were contemplating the, the payment of the first Robinson annuities in early 1851, uh, the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Canada ordered the preparation of a tabular return. Uh, and this tabular return was to include the, the names of all the persons who had received these licenses uh, and the price paid or agreed to be paid for each license, the extent of the territory, and also they wanted a copy of the treaty entered into uh, so, in other words, the Robinson Treaties. And so the, the combination of these two uh, strongly suggests that, that the reason for the inquiry to begin with was in relation to uh, the new treaties. Uh, otherwise, you know, why would they um, ask for this in, in the same paragraph? So immediately, the if we can turn to the next slide. Seven. Yes. So immediately the, the commissioner of Crown Lands provided the table. And as I said earlier, that it, it, I mean, the reason why it was immediate because it was already on hand. They didn't have to reconstruct it. They already had it in handwritten form in the record. And uh, so he provided a table showing the the locality of each track, the date the location was assigned, the price that had been agreed to pay, paid for it, uh, the price that was actually paid, and whether or not the installments had been paid. Uh, so all the information uh, that the Legislative Assembly had required was provided by Crown Lands. And this revealed that at that time, a total of 40,200 had been collected in license fees. So now keep in mind, the license fees are only, um, they're only intended to be, uh, to cover the costs of the survey and other expenses. Uh, although they were also simultaneously the down payment of, or the, of the first deposit. Uh, so a, a portion of some of the remaining installments had been paid by some of the license holders, but not very much. So the total gross income, including the license fees was, was only 45,000. So you'd still have to, from that, you still have to deduct the costs before you could get the net income. And in any event, the gross income was insufficient to meet the minimum uh, financial commitments under the treaties uh, if they were capitalized, which was, what, which was the way in which uh, the original instructions to Robinson had contemplated and, and also the way in which uh, the um, Crown Lands Department also viewed this. They, they saw this as a, um, you needed to have enough funds to provide 
uh, a capitalized, needed enough of a capitalized amount in order to uh, use the interest of that to pay, to pay for the uh, fixed annuity that was in the treaty. I don't want to throw you too much off, but is it possible this is the first time I'm hearing that the instructions to Robinson with respect to how much money he had on hand suggested that he presume the treaty territory would generate that capital amount? Well, the instructions, as you recall, said that we have on hand, I think it was 72 or 7,500 pounds. Yes. Uh, those were from the proceeds because Robinson inquired immediately after he was given his mandate, well, how much money uh, am I, do I have available to me? Right. And, the, and their answer was, well, we have 7,200 pounds available because they looked at the ledger of the mining license fees. And said, but that's the crown saying, this is how much money we have in the bank. This is how much money is available. However, you can um, negotiate under the understanding that you have this much in a capitalized amount. Right. Right. And so the whole assumption was is that is is that the the capitalized amount would serve as the interest to pay for the annuities. Yes. Right. And so and so so this is not the first time that capitalization is contemplated. Right? Capitalization of, of the, the mining licenses? No, of the annuities. Right. But did, was there, my question was, is this, is this the first time I'm hearing that there was a suggestion that the revenue from the territories had to create the capitalized amount? The, yes, the, the... Yes, it's the, the first time I'm hearing this? Well, I don't know if it's the first time you're hearing it. But well, in, if in, I didn't in, hear in from my... you before, let's just say <laughs> yeah. that. In my in my report, um, I, I think I, I made it quite clear that that um, in the in the early years uh, after the treaties were signed, the Crown Lands Department uh, and Russell in particular contemplated a fund that would be sufficient to um, uh, pay for the pre-augmented annuities. Right, and that this this fund would come from um, the proceeds of the lands, uh, and it was only later that um, there was you know discussion about whether it was actually necessary to use the funds from the lands as opposed to any other. But in actual practice, of course, the CRF was paying for the. Uh, the amount uh, in throughout the entire period from 1851 to 1869, it was, it was always. A, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, now I'll skip to another question I have from yesterday then. You make the point repeatedly that the money for the annuities came from the Consolidated Revenue Fund. That's right. And it's, I may be wrong, but I thought as I read it, you were distinguishing the Robinson treaties from others. But in fact, all of the annuities, the pre-Robinson annuities, which had been capitalized at, or which were 6655 every year, yes. were paid from the Consolidated Revenue Fund. That's right. So the Robinson Treaty annuities were not treated any differently. That's right. They were not treated any differently. Uh, however, the, the officials in the Crown Lands Department um, well, the, the, those commitments, uh, the, the fixed annuities had to be paid every year, no matter what, even if the lands right. gave you zero, right? That was a solemn obligation. I'm just trying to figure year. out if you're distinguishing the Robinson treaties from the other treaties and the payment of the annuities. Same, same thing for the pre-Robinson treaties. 
fixed amount, 6655. That's right. So they're the same as the previous uh, treaties in terms of how the payments came or were made and, and how they were funded, what the origins of the funds were. However, what in, in effect was happening here is that the Robinson treaties, uh, the, the, the crown obligation uh, was, was, was in effect a, uh, subsidizing um, a loss from the lands because they're not getting anything from the land. So the Crown lands officials were thinking of this as a sort of a way to, to help the Crown um, reimburse uh, the cost of these annuities. That, that's how they sort of construed it. So when, so when, for example, Russell later, as we'll see, I mean, it becomes clear as you go along because when, once you get to Russell in 1857, then it becomes a little more clear that, that so he's contemplating a fund by which he means a, a capitalized fund that would allow for the augmentation of the existing uh, treaty obligation. And Sprague looked at it the same way, right? So, so the answer to your question is it's both. It, it's both uh, treated exactly the same way as, as previous treaties, but with the, this additional um, component to it where they're also thinking of, of ways in which perhaps the proceeds from the lands could, could produce uh, funds to cover costs. If that makes sense, I think I, I think I've got it. Thank you. Yeah, it, it you know as it as it progresses through the eighteen fifties and into and then into the eighteen seventies, it becomes clear. I think. Did the uh, funding for the annuities remain? Did I hear you say it, it always came from the CRF at least yes. up to eighteen sixty nine or after as well? Yes, what, always. Yes. Um, would it be useful? Do you think for the court to have you go through, we had it up a second ago, but to, to speak the way through the table at page 37 of, of your report, um, would, would that assist with where you are in your discussion right now, do you think? Would it be useful? Yeah, sure. All right, let's, let's just get that up and maybe you could just walk us through that. Because capitalization, I mean, the amount you discussed, 7,200, I think is what you said, yes. 7,500, but whatever it was, I mean, as, a, as an amount to capitalize, what would that have generated as an annuity? Well, table three is my calculation of what, okay. of what the um, minimum financial commitments were. Uh, the capital sum that you needed to require to finance the the five hundred pound RST annuity and the six hundred pound RHT annuity uh, for the total. Remember, the total is one thousand one hundred pounds or four thousand four hundred. Right. So, in order to capitalize that amount uh, at the prevailing interest rate, which the was always six percent until later when it when they also used five percent. Uh, at six percent, it would require a capital sum of seventy three thousand dollars, and so more accurately seventy three thousand three hundred thirty three and thirty three cents. All right, so when you add that to the down payment that was already made, because remember it, Robinson's instructions were that this is the capitalization you should have in mind, but you should subtract from that mm -hmm. the down payment. And so as a consequence, the annuities would be less uh, because you, it's from the same pile of money. So the total minimum commitment then becomes 89,000. 
when you add the capital sum and the down payment that was already given. And so the, the revenue mining locations as of April 1850 were only 30,000. And so the difference requiring a subsidy, if you're gonna use proceeds from the land would be 59,000. And so you compare that to the figure that I gave in the slide 27, you'll see that um, the, even the total gross income was insufficient. Uh, when we're not talking even net here. So let me just see if I've got this. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Just the record is not clear that the witness is now speaking of RST and RHT combined, although the document says that, and it's important that we keep that in mind. Thank you. That's uh, a fair point. Uh, so this is, is partly connected to my other question, and, and it, it has to do with this, this, this um, some kind of distinction that is being made of, between the Robinson treaties and other treaties. So if I look at your table three on page 37, which is, as we know, um, referencing both treaties, it seems to be, because you're telling us what crown officials were uh, presuming and hoping for, it seems to be based on a presumption that within the first three or four years of the treaty, the lands would generate enough of a capital account to fund the annuities in perpetuity. The assumption is that um, the lands would, uh, yes, the lands would create a capital fund which would generate annuities into perpetuity but not necessarily in the first few years. They didn't know, it was, but, so, but that's an unknown. Okay, you know, but how, I'm just- How long it would take. I'm following yeah. your words, which right. were the Crown was subsidizing these annuities because the lands were operating at a loss. Yes. So is there, a, if it's operating as a loss, as opposed to this is an investment, we'll get our money in the future, they're thinking, there should be money immediately to capitalize the in perpetuity annuities? Yeah, they, they had no idea how much, I mean, nobody in, back then knew how much, uh, if any, the lands would actually produce. That, that, was, a, that was an unknown because, you know, these, these mining operations were, were not a, a good source of revenue and there were no other sources of revenue. Timber had not even been contemplated yet. Uh, land sales up there for settlers was exceedingly modest. So they really didn't know. But when, when asked, you know, for, for numbers, you know, um, I mean, Price, the, the first commissioner of Crown Lands, he, he sort of contemplated this idea that, that you know, the, the lands should, should produce the monies for a, a fund that would then pay for the pre-augmented annuities. Um, but there was never enough money to do that. Uh, well, Russell, Russell I, I, said- I, I, I just want to stop you because I don't want to get confused. There was never, I don't know if that never, that's what I was asking. Did they presume that it would be in the first three or four years? Um, I'm trying to figure out if they were looking at the Robinson treaties differently than the other treaties. Um, it, it's ba there's a totally different economy, obviously, going on. Yes. In Southern Ontario, they had land sales. Right. And in Northern Ontario, they're looking at a development of a mining uh, industry. Yes. They're not the same, but does anyone notice that? For what they're, I, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm looking at what I think are assumptions when you use yes. words like 
operate at loss. They needed to find these, uh, that they, your, your table says difference requiring a subsidy. Yes. But where does this idea of a subsidy come from? Is that your word? Well, the, no, it's, it's Because they were always paid out of the CRF. Yeah, but it's inherent in the logic of the original instructions to Robinson, right? If you look at the original instructions of Robinson, uh, to Robinson, it talks about, you know, having um, in contemplation a capitalized amount. And at the same time, it tells Robinson 7,500 know, pounds are available. And of course, you combine that with the population figures, and there's just no way you can get the $10 maximum annuity. It doesn't work. So um, Robinson, you know, was was forced to, you know, rejig the numbers, and uh, but he was, but he was still confined by this capitalized figure. Right. If you convert the capitalized figure to an annuity, right, after subtracting the down payment, the lands simply do not um, have the proceeds to fund the, uh, the fixed annuity. And yet the fixed annuity is a solemn obligation that has to be met each and every year, no matter what. And, and so um, I was just asking about assumptions, uh, but well, it's, I, it's, I, it, it's, it's not really an assumption. It, it's a, it's the logical necessity of the way that the, the capitalization is set up. A capitalization by its very nature presumes that there is at 6% a fixed amount every year. Right, it, it doesn't presume, you know, a, a different amount. It, it, you, you can you, once you have a figure like a hundred thousand at six percent, you know what the fixed sum is every year, and so that fixed sum had to be paid no matter what, whether it came from capitalized funds or not, it had to be paid. Whether it came from proceeds or not, it had to be paid. But the way some of these crown of lands officials um, contemplated this is that you know the lands them themselves would would produce the capitalized amount wouldn't produce the the annuities it would produce the capitalized amount which which would produce the annuities through interest that was exactly what i was asking yeah so some crown officials presumed that the lands themselves would produce the capitalized amount. Yes. And it appears that that presumption was close to immediate post-treaty. Because you use the terms loss yeah, as so, opposed to some period by under which they would, or during which they would wait. But do I have that right? That that yeah. presumption was close to immediate? Well, it was close to immediate in the sense that if we look at uh, Price, who's, who's the, the guy that, I have to look up the page. Just give me a moment to find the page where that's. We can uh, try and do a find. Is it in, it's in chapter three, is it? Yes, it is. Yeah, so if page 126 of my report, it 
So this is June 1851. Right. So this is at the time right. when they were starting to think about the first annuity uh, payments under the Robinson Treaties. And he says, the Commissioner of Crown Lands has the honor to submit for the favorable consideration of His Excellency, the Governor General and Council, the expediency of organizing the territory on the north shores of Lakes Huron and Superior, recently surrendered by the Indians with the view to raising funds to pay the Indian annuity. And then he goes on to make other further suggestions. And, um, so shall I assume that Price, if he's one of these crown officials that you say had a presumption that the lands themselves would produce a uh, capitalized amount, yes, um, that he was thinking about in the same terms as Southern Ontario treaties, that the land sales, well, I don't even know why they're thinking that because all the annuities were being paid out of the CRF, but in any event, that he's thinking it's the same kind of um, revenue generation possibilities? Uh, yes, I mean, that's, I mean, I, it's, you know, he says what he says, I, I, you know, we, we can, in my view, as I, as I interpret it, um, because I go on, um, you know, page 127, I said, interestingly, at this early juncture, the commissioner of crown lands seemed to think that the RST and RHG lands were to help in, quote, raising funds to pay the Indian annuity, end quote, that comprised part of the compensation for surrendering the Indian title. It is unclear whether he had in mind defraying the cost of the pre-augmented annuities, funding any augmented annuities or both. In any event, as someone in, and so forth, and he goes on, I go on to talk about his organizing the territory. Okay. So that was my understanding. Um, and, and I said, it, you know, it, it, it is interesting at, the, at that early juncture. I mean, throughout my report, I, I provide so many different scenarios by which the, the, the treaty obligations could have been, could have been um, met. I, I mean, it, it's it's not infinite, but it's a large number of different there are different ways of conceiving this. And you know, some officials uh, saw it one way; others saw it a different way. Uh, Price, in this instance, um, seems to have thought of it of it as being, you know, as he says, um, with the view to raising funds to pay the Indian annuity. That was the intent of organizing the territory, right? Yeah, just one last question and I, I really I'll give it back to Mr. Marcello. The, the annuities for the Southern Ontario treaties were paid from the CRF. Yes. They didn't have funds That's or right. they didn't have a special fund to pay those annuities. That's right. And they were getting $10 per person. That's right. And in irrespective of what the, the Commissioner of Crown Lands may have thought, uh, the Crown was actually never paying the annuities of the Robinson Treaties from any of the funds from the lands. I, I don't want to confuse right. that. I just was juxtaposing it with right. the, the pre-Robinson Treaties. Okay, back to you, sir. On that point, coming from the bench, uh, are you able to contrast the relative exposure the Crown had uh, as between the treaties in the South? I guess we'll call them the pre-1850 treaties, if that's correct, and the Robinson treaties? I'm not sure what, what you mean risk, by- Risk associated with them in terms of, you know, if there was some thought about uh, enough money being generated from the lands to directly or indirectly fund annuities. Uh, you know, how uh, is there a point of differentiation or not between the 
lands down south and lands up north. Well, in general, it was understood already in 1850 uh, that um, lands in the south uh, produced far more income than lands in the north. Why? Well, because of the environmental constraints on agriculture because most land sales in the South are to settlers who are engaged in an agrarian subsistence pattern. And um, it's the same today, I suppose, as, as back then. You know, you, you, you just need to drive from Toronto to Sudbury to see the difference. Let's get back uh, to mining in slide 28 and develop for us the uh, success, I say that in quotes of mining at, in, in this period of time, you, you continue your discussion on that slide, number 28. So uh, as I said, you know, these regulations that were passed in 1846, uh, made it very difficult for the government to actually get much money out of the, the mining. In fact, you know, since there's, it was not a royalty system, uh, they never got, the, the government never had a share of the actual proceeds from the mines. And the mines themselves were not very successful. There were exceptions like Bruce mines, for example. Uh, which, which did have, you know, which made some money. But a lot of these many mining locations where these people paid their, their $600, um, they never ended up paying any more installments because the, the, they either never ended up opening mines or the mines were unsuccessful and they operated at losses themselves. Uh, so this entire, idea that you know somehow the mining would produce funds for the payment of any annuities didn't work from day one and as you go through time you find that it became even worse because the, the new regime so the original 1846 regime paid you needed to pay four shillings, which was 80 cents per acre, but you were obliged to buy 6,400 acres, which was quite a lot. Um, so you had to, you had to basically pay before, you, you know, before you made any, before you made any money, you basically had a, a debt of $5,120 just to get the land. And so, as I said, very few individuals or companies actually ever had that. Uh, so the government really never received, in the vast majority of cases, these lands were not fully paid. So a new, a new regime in 1853 uh, tried to overcome some of the impediments that the mining companies had. And now suddenly the rules changed so that all you needed to do was pay a hundred bucks. You pay a hundred bucks, you get a license to explore any unoccupied area in the uh, territories. Obvious. Um perhaps question them, are you, do you have a view as to why this particular regulatory shift was made? Well, it was obviously made um, to encourage mining. It's sort of like today, you know, the government gives breaks to, to uh, large companies, uh, you know, tax relief or whatever, um, in order to encourage that, 
the companies. The, the government makes less money, but it, it encourages the companies to invest. And that was the idea behind it back then as well. Thank you. You know, it's, um, you know they, they reduced the cost to the mining companies. And so the government made a lot less, but it, it was intended as encouragement for, for mining. So the fee dropped to $100, uh, and you didn't have to commit yourself to 6,400 acres. Now you only had to buy 400 acres. It's a huge difference. And the idea behind that, I think, is that if you didn't, if you, if you can produce a mine on 400 acres, then, you know, there's no mine to be had. Uh, and so they thought, well, you know, 6,400 acres is probably way too much. To, it's not needed for, for mining operations. It's just a huge tract of land. And so at the end of two years, you could fully pay for the location at a rate of, of seven shillings and six pence per acre. So it's, that's, that's $1.50 an acre. So the, 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 the amount you paid per acre was higher, but the, the uh, number of acres you would purchase are a lot lower. The net cost was therefore lower? Yeah, so when you look at the old regulations, the 1846 regulations, theoretically, if, if the companies paid for everything, which most often they did not, the most the government would ever get would be $5,120. Under the new regulations, the most the government would ever get was $700. So you see how the, the amount that the government did or could receive is significantly reduced um, by 1853. Is that in the long term or in the short term or both? Uh, well, they, they continue to tinker with this. Um, Why? Well, because it, you know, it just, it still, it still didn't work. Um, over the course of time, as we'll see in later slides, the, the, um, they, they tried different approaches to this and changed the rules again. Uh, because they, you know, the, one of two things was happening. Either there was no large increase in mining operations, um, or the government wasn't getting any money from these operations uh, either way. So uh, they kept tinkering with it over time. It was, it was, not, <laughs> it was not something that was ever written in stone. The next point in time you address is uh, on slide 29. It's 18, the 1857 Legislative Assembly request. Yeah, so in 1857, the, the Assembly requested uh, details from land sales, including mining lands. Uh, when they say land sales in the RST territory, they're not really talking so much about sales of lands to settlers. They're talking about sales of lands to mining companies. So, and in fact- S when Sales we, of land to mining companies? Yes, because remember, that's how, that's how any money was made, was not in the, the mining, from the mining itself per se, right. but rather from the sale of the lands on which mining was to proceed. Right. So details of- income from land sales are requested. Yes. Now, I found no evidence that this uh, request by the Legislative Assembly was made specifically to find out whether uh, the government um, had reached, uh, you know, whether the lands had reached an amount sufficient for the government to augment the the annuities that were being paid every year. But uh, the compilation of that kind of data, which occurred throughout the 1850s, um, made it at least possible to do so. Did uh, the timber 
factor into this request or not? I see you mentioned it. Well, uh, yeah, they, they did ask, you know, what monies that were collected from granting timber limits. And it's not, I mean, there was a very modest effort, especially in the RHT territory, uh, not, not in, this, in the RST territory. Uh, but it turned out that, you know, I mean, timber was not really a, a major source of income until, you know, the, the early 1870s. So- In which territory? Uh, in primarily, primarily in RHT. So prim just so I understand, primarily in RHT and not until more or less the 1870s, the 1870s? Yeah, we'll get to that in much more detail when we get to the, the actual figures and the tables. So um, Cochon provides the information in March? Yes. And um, again, it, it basically showed what I've already indicated earlier. It, it demonstrated that the mining licensing system was not a significant source of revenue, except in the year 1856, when, again, because of certain incentives, um, the original locations, or an, an, some of the original locations were finally patented because the mining companies would not receive a patent to these lands until they had actually paid the full amount. And to encourage, uh, they, were, they were in jeopardy of losing, you know, even their down payments if they didn't get around to eventually patenting these, these lands. And so there was a flurry of, of interest in, in ensuring that they made their final payments. And so, there was a, a spike in the year 1856 when a number of the original locations were patented simultaneously. And you then discussed the Cochon, uh, Cochon annual report. You address this on slide 30. Yeah, so, so the Commissioner of Crown Lands was also required. Uh, and this requirement did not exist until, until the mid 1850s because you know, the, there really was no, not much income from lands uh, at all. Where? Uh, well, I mean, income from lands was always modest as I, as I testified to yesterday. It's not, it wasn't like in the United States. Um, uh, the, the, the government of the day in, in the United Provinces of, of Canada uh, did not generate much income from lands. Most of their, their income was from uh, customs and excise duties. Uh, but this sort of steadily changed over the course of, of time. And so the, the legislature decided that it might be a good idea for the Crown Lands Department to give annual reports just uh, devoted to uh, income and expenditures relating to crown lands. And in fact, the whole crown lands department then was engaged in, in um, keeping uh, track of um, everything to do with uh, income and expenditures. And that had to be, the details of that had to be given in an annual report. And so I started looking at these annual reports and um, the, the one for 1856, which was presented in 1857, it, usually the reports would be at the end of the fiscal year, which was as it is today, March 31st. And so they, you'd, you'd find these, these reports uh, months into the following year. But here you're talking about the fiscal year for the UPC, not, not Ontario, right? Yes, of course. Right. Yeah. So the, so now we start getting really good numbers um, right down to the shilling and, and pence uh, on how much was, uh, what the gross amounts were. Um, there would be allusions to 
deducting charges, although it was not always clear what they included as charges. Uh, so for example, um, there was in 1857, a revenue from mining that consisted of payments for licenses and the installments on locations uh, in the amount of 6,452 pounds, eight shillings. And then after deducting charges, whatever they were, there was a net of 5,377 pounds, eight shillings. So these are pretty specific. They're, they're obviously based on very specific um, tabulations of income and costs. Uh, but when you look at some of the actual costs, you realize that Koshan was not actually including um, some of the charges relating to exploration of these lands, because he also gives the cost of that. That's your last bullet? Yes, and then you, you can see that you know, those, those are pretty expensive. I mean, this is, this is just in one year. There's no surveying by air back then. I no, these these guys are these guys are out in the bush with a team. There's a team of guys who are out in front hacking through the bush with axes, and then another team behind them dragging these long, heavy chains to to measure the distances. And it was a, you know, and of course, this is in the middle of nowhere for them and they need to be victualized and provisioned. And it's, it's a long and complicated and very ex expensive affair. And that's just to draw a single line, sur survey a line. And, and from there, you, you have to start, you know, doing all the rest that survey entails. So that, that was, a, a, actually, we shouldn't underestimate the expense of that. That's, that was not a small expense. Slide 31, some progress is reported. Yeah, so by 1856, you, you have um, some comments about what he describes as the Huron and Superior Territory, although he's rather vague about how he defines that. And he hinted that development in that region was still in its infancy. Mining operations were quote, as yet, but very limited, end quote. <coughs> Although there was always an expectation that it would eventually become a source of wealth. This is a theme that you find throughout these early reports. Um, they're telling the, their superiors and the government in general that, look, yeah, we're not getting much out of this land, but you know what, we, we think it's got potential. And that, you know, there's a, that's the same thing over every year. It's the same story. Like, you know, we're still not getting too much, but it, you know, the, the, in time, give it time and we'll, it'll generate income. And he suggested doing away. So this would have been another re regulatory rejig. He suggested doing away with the license fee entirely. Yeah, I mean, he, I mean, he, he, he sort of, he favored the 1853 uh, regulations, but in his view, um, he wanted to get rid of the $600 fee altogether. Um, again, as a means to encourage more interest. Um, talk to us if you would about timber revenues at that time, you address it in slide 32. Yeah, so there, there was a, in those days, they, they got uh, revenues from timber in two different ways. There were something called ground rents. And, and I must confess, I'm, I don't know the intricacies of how that worked. Uh, and then also there was an amount on duties. And so Cochin uh, revealed that when it came to the timber revenues, it consisted almost entirely of ground rents. Um, and very little from the duties accrued on timber. 
So presumably these duties are, are ones that like once you, once you cut down the, the logs, they, they'd be counted and measured and, and then uh, before or after they, they got to Montreal or wherever they ended up, uh, the duties would be imposed on them. So he gave figures for those as well. Um, what complicates things from our perspective today, trying to reconstruct this, I mean, I always had the, the, the view of trying to see how much there actually was. Uh, it's always difficult from these annual figures because the, the territories are so ill-defined. And so, the income, the, the figures that I give on that slide, they come from regions as far south as the Severn River and beyond the Severn River. And, and uh, for that reasons, uh, for that reason, they're, they're arguably outside of the RHT territories. Uh, so because one, once you get beyond the Severn River, you know, you're into, um, territories that were already ceded under the pre-1850 treaties. Mm -hmm. And the same holds true for the Ottawa Valley, because um, most of the timber during this period and throughout much of the 19th century actually came out of the Ottawa Valley drainage system. And so it made a huge difference whether um, you understood the Robinson Huron Treaty to extend only to the height of land separating the Ottawa Valley watershed from the Georgian Bay watershed, or, the, or whether you extended it to, right to the limits of uh, the two Canadas. Depending on which option you take, you either include or exclude enormous timber revenues. Should we conclude, therefore, that the Crown did not um, make it either a purpose or a priority to actually track proceeds from the treaty territory? The, the understanding of the treaty territory itself was um, vague enough that it would be difficult for them to specify in, with, with any precision precisely how many of these, these uh, uh, proceeds came from the RHT. The, that, the, excuse the, me, the that, RHT. That, that might be a reason why they didn't, yeah. but that wasn't my question. Is it, can one conclude that they did not make it a priority or a purpose to track proceeds that were unique to the treaty territories? I think that would be fair to say, Your Honor. But on your next slide, you, you talk about information now being available. I guess, for analyzing the augmentation provision in the treaty. So can you square that with what you just told Your Honor? Yeah, so my first bullet point, it makes precisely <clears throat> that point. Uh, within certain territories, they refer to, you know, the Lake Superior and Lake Huron territories. They didn't refer to the RST or RHT territories. And therein lies the problem, I think, Your Honor, you were identifying. Sorry, say, say that again. Please. So if you look back at, on the previous slide. What, uh, where are we going to, 32? Yeah, 32. Okay. So I have in quotation marks on the second bullet, the actual words. These were 
monies accrued and collected in the, quote, Huron and Superior Territory, end quote. But that territory was never really accurately defined. Uh, unsurprisingly, I must add, because though the treaty itself referred to, you know, heights of land and in some cases, even the continental divide which was roughly mapped, the vast majority of people didn't understand where that was on the ground. It had never been surveyed. No one had ever surveyed the height of land. Now, even the height of land separating the, the Ottawa River watershed from the Georgian Bay watershed, the exact location of that height of land was unknown until the late 19th century. Nobody had ever gone into the bush and actually looked for it. It was known in certain locations, for example, at just to the east of North Bay at the Levaz Portage, which had for centuries been used by canoeists to travel from Montreal to, mm -hmm. to Lake Superior. I mean, I've traveled up by canoe myself. It's easy to see where the height of land is there. But you try finding it elsewhere, nobody really knows where it was. For your second bullet here on slide 32, someone was tracking at least forestry numbers. Yes, in, in you know, what is described as, as a Huron Superior Territory. Now I suspect, and I have not, you know, I, I have to confess, I, I have not looked uh, into a more fine grained data, which may or may not even be available, where the actual local uh, inspectors who are, you know, um, who, are, who are mandated to control the, the, uh, the ground rent system and the, and the uh, beauty system, Presumably, they have records of where each of these timber uh, resources are coming from. Like there has to be a geographical location where they came from. But the annual reports of the uh, Crown Lands uh, Commissioner isn't that fine grain. So I suspect the data was there or is there somewhere. I just, uh, you know, I mean, it was, it was bad enough trying to trying to go through through all of these yearly reports and, and trying to track down what the basis of those reports were is, is even is another step that would require you know months of more research, even if we found the archival. That records. would be feed-in data, the data that would feed into something yes. like a Cochon report, whatever. But I, I think if we go to 33, uh, you say that in general, Pochon's report reveals the type of information the Crown Lands Department was tracking and, and was sufficiently comprehensive to permit estimates of both income realized and costs incurred within certain territories. Yes, I mean, um, you, th th that's quite clear. I mean, you, if, you, if you were asked, you know, how much did the territories, uh, you know, the, 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 the Lake Huron and, and Lake Superior territories uh, provide you with, you know, you may not be able to get a fine grain analysis and you may have some uncertainties about, especially the RHT territory, but on the, for the most part, this should have been a, sufficient to provide you with at least the estimates. And in, and in fact, this is the kind of information that did eventually result in estimates in, would, in the, in the 1870s. Would that include for the RST? Yes, I, I think it would it'd probably be easier for the RST because you don't have the ambiguities of the treaty language in respect to the boundaries. And so that's basically what you're addressing in your second bullet. Not the RST, you told us about the RST, but the use to which this information could be put. Yes. Yeah. 
And you know the particular importance of uh, the report in your last bullet, which kind of follows to me on the theme from the second bullet. Yes. So this 1856 report um, is, is important because um, it was immediately followed by the first recorded uh, opinion on whether the amounts realized from the disposal of the lands north of Lakes Superior and Huron were sufficient <coughs> to allow an augmentation of the Robinson Treaty annuities. Now, Your Honor, um, we move to the Russell opinion next. Yes. It might be early for a break. It might not. I'm, I'm in your hands. I just want to raise that we're going into a, a, a different uh, opinion now. And would you? Do you okay. I, I'm uh, thinking we should go to Russell. 1130. And uh, it may be that the break will, will still be on the Russell report. But sure. uh, let's That's try it. Let's move to Russell, slide 34. Uh, you have the table of players at the back of your report, but why don't you, um, of the slide deck rather, why don't you tell us who Richard Pennefather was first and then who Russell was? Yeah, so. Uh, I mean, you kind of do, but maybe expand on that a bit. So uh, Richard Pennefather was the Superintendent General of Indian Affairs. Uh, and he was also one of the commissioners who was uh, mandated to do a comprehensive inquiry into all matters relating to Indian affairs in the United Province of Canada. And he generated uh, a report that came to be known as the Pennefather Report. So he was he was involved as, as both the Superintendent General uh, and also as um, a, a commissioner for that um, inquiry. And uh, Andrew Russell was the Assistant Commissioner of Crown Lands. And who was the commissioner at this time again? Um, well, <laughs> to refresh my memory, I'll have to go to the cast of characters, which is at the end of the, I can't remember who the, was it Price? Or? Yeah, it, it may still have been Price. It, see, these, the, the reason I'm, I just want to confirm is because they there was there was a series of them and they they weren't always the same person. Well, it, it would have still have been Joseph Couchon, right? Because this is keep in mind this was just months after that report. So he's so he's still the he's still the commissioner. Followed by Russell on the hierarchy, and then Pennefeather's below Russell somewhere. No, no, no. Pennefather is is a superintendent general of Indian Affairs. That's nice a different, different department. department. Okay, okay. So, yeah. All right. So, so so Pennefather is asking the Crown Lands Department for information on whether the value of the land ceded under the Robinson Treaty. And Pennefather refers to it as one treaty. Uh, so it, under the treaty has yet increased sufficiently to warrant the augmentation of the annuity in the manner contemplated by the treaty. Those are his words. Right. So that's a request. It is a lateral request. Yes. From one department to another. Yes. Yeah. So the top civil servant in the department of the Crown Lands, who's Andrew Russell, now, Russell is, is sort of the senior guy. He's not the elected. I mean, the Crown Lands Commissioner is an elected position, obviously, just similar to how it's structured today. Um, the, the commissioner is an elected position, and the, the assistant uh, commissioner 
is a, is the top civil servant who has been there, you know, for a long time. Right. And and so Crown, so Andrew Russell um, responds at, with a conclusion that they that the you know the lands had not uh, increased sufficiently. So his October 9th, eighteen fifty seven response. Uh, I quote in full because this is all he says about it. So it's easy to, to quote. So he says, quote, I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of your letter of the seventh inst. So INST is short for instant, which in 19th century correspondence referred to the, the same month. Uh, Ultimo referred to the previous month. So he receives a letter on the 7th. And then he says, to inform you in reply that the government having expended large sums in explorations and surveys on the north shores of Lakes Huron and Superior has not realized as yet from the disposal of the lands in those regions, a sufficient sum to form a fund for the payment of the annuity agreed upon with the Indians on their surrender of those lands and is not at all likely for some time to come to be in a position to increase that annuity." End quote. And at the top of the next slide, my terms of logic may not be right, so forgive me, but you make under a deduction or an inference there, I think. Can you speak to that, please? Yeah, so now keep in mind that, that Cochon is responsible for providing the annual report. However, he relies on the, the civil servants to provide the information, just as you know, the structure it would be today. And so Russell, in all likelihood, had been responsible for producing many of the figures that, that Koshan relied on in his um, annual report. And so for Russell to have been able to form such an opinion, he must have reviewed the records tracking income from what he called the disposal of the lands and then also records tracking sums expended on what he called explorations and surveys. There's no question that he used the annual report, which he had helped to prepare. And he, he probably had you know, earlier and more recent accounting that, that was not included in the report because the report of course was, was um, <coughs> based on information in 1856 whereas Russell would have had information uh, after that as well uh, for, for the, the month since. And he, since he was there for such a long period of time uh, and was intimately involved in you know, the, the ins and outs of the Crown Lands Department, he would also have been aware of the historical trajectory of the revenues. That is not just for the year 1856 and 57, but you know, you know, throughout. I mean, that's where the records were in his department. And he would have, you know, obviously um, been aware of all of those in order to even hazard the view that the increase contemplated by the augmentation clause, however he understood it, was unlikely in the foreseeable future. Can you uh, explain what you're saying here in, in bullet three? Uh, you're, you're going back to the CRF here. Uh, and tying this into Russell in some way, are you? Yeah, so. S sorry, slide 35. Laura. Yeah, bullet three, Your Honor. Thank slide you. 35. 
Yeah, so as, 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 I've, as I've explained, the Robinson Treaty annuities came from the CRF. So they, they were being paid every year um, from a, a source other than the proceeds. There's no evidence that any of them, any of the, the proceeds from the mining licensing system, licensing system, the land sale, auctions, forestry, or any, any of those sources were placed in any kind of dedicated fund. But Russell's wording implies that, in fact, no such fund had been formed because he, he, he says, you know, if you, if you look at his wording again, he says, um, in those regions, a sufficient sum to form a fund for the payment of the annuity. So it's a fund. And so what he had in mind is probably an interest bearing capital sum. And this is where we go back to you know, where I talked about the, the, the capitalization of the, that was in, contemplated at, at the time of Robinson's instructions. Uh, I, I think that's what he had in mind is, is um, and ra rather than, you know, a system where, you know, you get proceeds that are sufficient to cover the annuity for, let's say, 1856, and then you pay the annuity with that. Rather, what it has in mind is a, a is an annuity fund that is generated from some kind of capitalized fund. So it's a larger amount that's required. But then once you have that, the annuity obligations can be met by by um, the interest from in that fund. And do you ever see in your research? an explanation for why they were looking for such a fund. Pay the Robinson Treaty annuities where they didn't have such funds to pay the, that that, that as, as far as we know, I, but we don't have that research before us, that they didn't have such funds to pay the annuities from Southern Ontario treaties. Yeah, no, I, I, I can't explain why the, any of these crown officials contemplated one system over another. We know that Sprague is also consistent here in the sense that he also, when it came time to the, uh, not, not the, the pre-augmented, but the augmented annuities, when it came time to the augmented annuities, Sprague also contemplated a capitalized. Right, but I was fund. just asking if you have seen some explanation why the North, Northern Ontario no. treaties were being treated differently. Okay, thank you. At the top of the next slide, you, you discuss some uh, options and you say it's not clear which one Russell had uh, in his contemplation. Can you take us through that? And I see uh, there's a reproduction there of the table that you went through about, I don't know, 35 minutes ago, uh, which maybe you can yes. gloss over as you, as you do this. Yeah, as I said earlier, I mean, throughout my report, I stress that there are so many different options by which the treaty obligations could have been met. And, it, and it's, you know, the, Russell's comment is very brief, as you, as you saw, I just quoted it in total. Uh, and it's so it, it's unclear what exactly he was contemplating, but it's, to me, it's, it's more likely that it was, you know, a capitalized sum. So if we, if we look at the time of treaty, um, you would need this um, And didn't we go through this charter? Yeah, we, 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 did, we already went through this. Um, so th there probably isn't any need to go through it again. But it uh, shows the subsidy. Now. Yes, so that's, that's, um, that's really what, what would be required under that scenario. That's what would be required. So, so those are the kinds of figures, you know, that, you know, keep in mind that in my report, I went through all these different scenarios and this is the one that is closest to what actually happened when um, there was a capitalization uh, 
later on. I mean, it, it, clearly, the, the, the one thing that that um, comes through in all of this is that capitalization was seen as the best route to meeting the treaty obligations. And that eventually applied to the pre-1850 treaties as well, because they also were capitalized eventually. Are you talking about the obligation, the pre-augmentation annuities? Yes. Um, slide 37. Tell me about this capital fund. What, 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 what would it have done? It's, a, it's an yeah, another so, option. Yeah, so let's say um, now, <clears throat> The other way of looking at this is, is to say, look, the proceeds from the lands are not really relevant to the payment of the uh, pre-augmented annuity, the fixed sum that is provided for in the treaty, right, from the start, the one that's being paid every year. But then, as it turned out, of course, um, and as actually happened, there was a contemplation that the difference between the pre-augmented annuity and the amount that was enough to give everyone $4 per capita, assuming a time of treaty population, um, it would have involved a fund of 104,110. And this is not, so this is another way in which Russell could have conceived this. And this is not entirely hypothetical. I'm just not, I'm not making this up as a possible scenario. This is what actually happened in 1873 when Sprague recommended pretty much the same thing. Um. So what my point here is that in order to come up with this estimate that the lands did not, or, or I should say a conclusion that the lands had not had enough revenues to, to provide for a fund, uh, he would have to adopt one of several different viable options. And we just don't know enough about their thinking to be confident to say, well, he adopted this one as opposed to another. Well, is there another option here in bullet three or am I just maybe not, maybe just confused? Yeah, so there's another option. Um, there's a, there's, you know, the, the scenario by which the wording of the augmentation clause could be partially met by paying out any difference between the higher collections and the lower expenditures in, in any one year. And without setting up a capital fund or paying out the maximum per capita cap, right? So, so this is a scenario where, where, as I said earlier, you know, as soon as let's say in the year 1856, there was a you know, a spike in land sales or something, you, you pay off that um, to, uh, to pay the annuity for that year. But then in the following year where the spike went down, there'd be no augmentation at all. So that would be like a year by year kind of calculation. Um, that's another viable scenario that, you know, that. And there's so, there's so many different ways of looking at this that um, I can see why there's there was considerable confusion that reigned over the course of this entire period because not, every everyone came up with a different way in which to um, meet the obligation and, and of those I think the most sophisticated probably. Uh, 
in the terms of its thinking was Sprague's, which we'll get to uh, in 1873. Dr. Von Gernet, on slide 38, at the very beginning, you say, while uncertainties remain about how exactly the decision was reached in the fall of 1857, it's obvious that the Crown Lands Department had colon, compiled information necessary to reaching a conclusion. I assume you mean a conclusion regarding augmentation? Yes. Uh, next. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yes. And, and then you, another put, way to put it, read the threshold. Yes. yes. Okay. And next, investigated the feasibility of augmenting the Robinson annuities. So they had done that, you're saying? Yes. And ultimately determined that an increase was not yet possible. Yes. Perhaps an obvious question. What, on what do you base those three conclusions? Well, I mean, the, the Russell report that we just referred to, um, that's a clear indication. Um, and, you know, I, I follow up by saying, you know, whether or not the opinion was justified, uh, because he didn't give many details. Uh, whether it was justified would depend less on the actual numbers and more on the interpretation that you give to this, right? Because as I said, there's so many different ways of reaching the result. And depending on which assumptions you <coughs> hold, you might reach a very different result. And you go on to explain that in the second last bullet. Yeah, I mean, I should add that, that it's unlikely that Russell contemplated a system where as soon as you reached a year where there was a, it, where it was, where the expenditures, uh, where, the, where the proceeds exceeded the costs and you had a difference that you could pay to the annuities. That, that he contemplated that that was the threshold that was met, right? He, he, I think he was thinking more in terms of a fund, like a capitalized fund that was a much higher amount, which would then generate the income into perpetuity, much well, like Sprague had contemplated. Because why? Because otherwise there'd be a risk of no annuities in one or more years? Well, because, because I think by, 1857, there could be an argument uh, made. And I think later, as we look at the, the statistics uh, that were generated in the 1870s, um, uh, it's, it's possible that in a year like 1856, where remember I said that there were some, there was a spike in the number of uh, patents for the, it's possible that in that year, you know, the, the under one interpretation of the augmentation clause that, that the threshold had been met. Uh, threshold but, but, to but only for one, for one year. To go beyond the base amount. Yeah. Could I, just to see if I understand it, you're <coughs> saying it's likely that Russell's conclusion that the threshold had not been met was based on an assumption that the threshold, that to meet the threshold required a capitalized fund which obviously was a bigger number than an amount which would have justified an increase in any one year. Yes, I, I, it may, it, he may not have said that, no, no. that he, or I, I wouldn't call it a requirement. It may have, he may have seen it as his interpretation of the augmentation clause, or it may have been his preference. Who knows? I mean, it's, but, it's, what I was asking you, you, you said likely Russell's conclusion was. Yes. So my question is, is it, it, is it correct to follow your line of thinking? Likely that, that um, his conclusion that the threshold had not been met was based on an assumption that there wasn't a capitalized fund pay the annuities in perpetuity. 
Well, he would have known that there was no capitalized yes. amount, right? Because I was looking for what you started a sentence. Likely his conclusion was based on. Yes. Likely his conclusion was based on a scenario, a postulated scenario in which the uh, threshold of the augmentation clause was met once you had uh, a fund that was sufficient to pay out uh, what was then understood as the maximum augmentation. In perpetuity? Yes. Okay. And that is exactly what Sprague later proposed. So oh, I, I just want to know about Russell's right. presumption, if I have it. Thank you. What you say in 36, give at the top, given the many different options, for meeting the treaty obligations, it's not clear which one Russell had in his contemplation. Yeah, it is, as I said. I mean, it, it is me, clear it's, it's, or it is not clear. No, it's not clear at all. But in my view, it's more likely um, that he did not consider this to be like a year to year payment, rather a, a, a capitalization. Well, what does it cap? Sorry, go ahead. So, in other words, getting enough monies to put into a fund that would then serve to uh, pay for the annuities. Well, there'd be an annuity every year in the case of a capitalized fund, right? Yeah, but we're talking about the, the uh, augmented right. portion. Yeah, the other ones were getting paid as you said several times. No yeah, no, nobody's, there are no augmentations at this point. Right. Right. So the, the whole point here is he's, he's thinking of a fund that would augment the existing fixed annuities, which are being paid out of, this, out of the uh, consolidated revenue fund. A result of which would be reliability, I presume. I'm sorry? A result of which would be reliability or dependability of funding, I, I presume, in contrast yes. to, you know, did we make money this year or didn't we make money this year? Right. Your Honor, do you want to do the break now? You mentioned what? 1135. What? Thank you. We'll take 15 minutes. Yeah. All right. Fifteen minutes. This core recess. We're all right. Before we move on, Doctor, could we flip back to slide 36 just for a second? I want to clarify something, if we can. In the table three, yes, the fourth item down, revenue from mining locations as of April 1850, yes, $30,000, I'll go in dollars, $30,000. Do you know what period of time that $30,000 dollars accrued during like was it one year was it 20 years was it you know that's the entire period starting from the first mining license which would have been either 1845 or 1846 sometime in that and was mining i thought you said mining was the principal source of revenue in the rst Yes. 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 And I, I'm, I'm about to ask a question that I'm nervous to ask. Bruce Mines. Is Bruce Mines in RHT or RST? It's in RHT. Okay. <clears throat> Go ahead. So on 39, 
we, we get into a section you call modest revenues and high costs. Now, costs had been considered to an extent earlier. Can you just develop how, how, uh, how costs factor in going forward here, take us forward from here? Yeah, I don't think there's, there's a need to go through it in, in much detail. Um, it's basically variations of the same theme year after year. Uh, in 1858, it is particularly striking because the annual report noted that $100 was received on the account of mines being the fee of a mining license on the westerly shore of Lake Superior. And then it continues with inactivity is believed to exist in regard to mining operations with scarcely an exception, but that of the Bruce mines, which as we just noted was, was an RHT. But it is hoped that a fresh impetus will be given to the endeavors to bring the mineral riches of the shores of the Great Lakes into the market by the surveys and explorations now in progress for the development of the resources of the vast territory lying to the west of Lake Superior. And so I just noted that um, when you look at the records, this $100 was the total income from mining in the entire province of Canada. Total gross income? Yes. Eight, 19, 1858. It's the well. It's um, it's the annual report for eighteen fifty eight. Continue on slide forty uh, and talk about the annual report. What what it shows, please. So once again, I mean this the the theme continues of modest revenues and high costs. And, you know, I mean, you, you, you can see the figures uh, for yourself, but one thing I notice is that, you know, it's again, a challenge for anyone who's tasked with ascertaining whether the proceeds had reached the, the, the sufficiency to meet the conditions of the augmentation clause, because the, the RHT was so poorly defined. And, you know, they keep talking about you know, all these monies coming in from the Ottawa River uh, watershed. And uh, depending on whether you include that watershed or not, makes a huge difference. And I mean, there are maps to this day of the Robinson Huron treaties, which extend to the Ottawa River uh, incorrectly, in my view. Uh, but it remains an issue, right? To, to the present day. And it's, it's an issue that I worked on for months um, to try and sort out. Uh, so it, it, you know, the fact that it still is an issue today um, makes it unsurprising that it was an issue back then. And it was not an issue that they resolved to their satisfaction until 1877. To whose satisfaction? to the satisfaction of what was then uh, Canada and Ontario. So on the cost side of the equation, as you say on slide 41, Russell reported in 1858 that $40,922.91 comprised the cost of surveying township outlines as well as base lateral lines north of Lake Huron in an area south of Lake Nipissing. So this sounds like the RHT. Yes. Um, and then from that, he made a conclusion reflected in the second bullet. Yeah, so you recall that Russell had uh, concluded that, that not only were there insufficient uh, proceeds in 1857, but he thought that for some time to come, there would not be sufficient proceeds. And so uh, he um, 
was likely aware of the costs that were still to come uh, for surveys. And uh, you know, the surveying operation continued throughout much of the 1850s. It's not something you could do in one summer season. You only have, you know, basically, I mean, after the mosquitoes and black flies, you've only got two months at most, and then um, you're back into winter again. You don't want to <laughs> insult all surveyors by saying they don't go out in the black fly. That's, uh, that was not my intention, but I'm just saying that the, the seasons were relatively short. And, and uh, so, you know, the, uh, so progress was slow and, and the, the country was vast. That, those, those are the bottom lines. And so, um, you know, this, this would take a long time. And uh, so it, overall, the picture was, you know, every year when you read these reports and they're very detailed, they're very long and detailed. Uh, and every year, if you, if you go through these, the picture you get is, is modest revenues and high costs. Your bullet on, on surveying costs on slide 41 addresses the RHT. Don't, let, don't be led by me, I'm sure you wouldn't anyway. Did, did you say in your evidence earlier that the survey costs, as a point of clarification, the survey costs in the RST were also high? Well, um, or do you know? surveying was done in both. Um, But I think there was more surveying being done in the RHT because those lands were closer to uh, a portion of Upper Canada that was settled, and so you were beginning to get, you know, the the idea that you you'd be putting in colonization roads that went north from the settled portions of Upper Canada, uh, straight north up into in, into the wilderness. And so that, you know, whereas the RST was more remote. And so the, the, most of the serving done in the RST was mainly around um, the areas where, where there were uh, posts and mining operations and, and so forth. Um, there wasn't so much necessity for uh, settlement other than for mining purposes. Would it be easier to survey the RST as compared to the RHT or the same? Well, it would it be more difficult, obviously. More, more difficult. Yes, yeah, much more difficult. It's not even obvious to me. Why would it be more difficult? With well, the RST? it just the, you know, even today, I mean, it's so much easier to travel from what used to be Upper Canada to RHT territory than it is to RST territory. So just getting there, this is just a far more remote area. They no longer have a porter flight. <laughs> that's, that's, well, the, that's the metric. So yeah, yeah. I mean, one has to keep in mind that you know. Excuse me, you have a technical issue. Okay. Did you miss anything? To Mr. Carney, doctor. Slide 42. Yes. You say in the fall of 1858, Richard Carney advised Hennefeather that he'd attended a Garden River Band Council meeting. And again, Carney was who? Uh, that's a very good question. Of all the characters in this whole play, he uh, seems to be the most difficult to track a biography. Uh, he sort of self-described as a commissioner, although with an unidentified portfolio. Um, the secondary the sources refer to him variously as a magistrate. Um, there's even one occasion where he's referred to as a sheriff. He he definitely has legal a legal background, as you can tell from the language of the documentary record that he leaves us. 
Now, but beyond that, we really know very little. He's, he's stationed in the Sault Ste. Marie area, uh, which is where Garden River is. Garden River is just to the uh, east of where the nascent settlement of the Sioux was located. Right. And that's, a, that's about all we know about well, we, him. We know he attended a Garden River Band Council meeting. Yes, uh, because he tells us that. And then um, among other matters, uh, and I mentioned him on several occasions throughout my report. So this is just the first occasion that I mentioned him. Uh, and uh, among other matters discussed at that meeting, which I also returned to later in my report, uh, was the RHT annuity augmentation. And he reported, because as you know, the Garden River Band was um, in the RHT. And he, uh, he reported that, that the Anishinaabeg believed that they were to receive 600 pounds per annum for four years, and after that, $4 per head. And Carney explained to them that, you know, in, this, this is not actually how it worked. Um, and I suspect that Carney's view of the treaty was almost entirely informed by his reading of the treaty itself. Uh, and, and he basically just said, you know, in the event the condition specified in the clause was met, there would be an increase in their annuity quote, in proportion to the sum of money realized, which might be any sum between what they were receiving and $4, but that it was not to exceed $4, end quote. Now, where does the four years come from in, in bullet one? It seems, if I'm reading you correctly, to be a, a bit of a mystery to you. Yes. Um, the four years is an interesting concept because and I think I had testified to this in the first, um, in stage one, as I recall. Um, it, it's, it's unknown where that comes from, that impression uh, of four years. It is, you know, possible that, well, first of all, nobody knew uh, how, what the proceeds would do in the future in 1850. Uh, to be able to say that four years from now, you're going to get this $4 instead of the 160 or whatever it was at the time of treaty. Uh, nobody was in a position to say that. However, you know, it's conceivable that there were discussions about sort of the estimated time periods when this might materialize. You know, who knows? It, it may not be an impression that came out of nowhere. It may have been based on some you know, conversations that occurred at the time of treaty. Because this isn't, this isn't really that far off you know, from the time of treaty, right? right. So what's fascinating about that particular um, four years is that it reoccurs in another oral tradition much later in the record in the I believe it was in the 1890s when uh, this again, the same four year figure came up as being the interval between the time that they got their pre augmented annuities and the time that they got their full annuities to the $4 cap. And so, except that in the latter version, it was $10 instead of $4. So somewhere along the line, there was an impression that it, it would take about four years for this to happen. And so Carney, you know, <laughs> the only thing he could say that, you know, was look, you know, that's, that's, not, what the, that's not what the treaty says. Um, this being a bump to $4 for this to happen? No, this, this, this interval of four years is what I'm talking about. But what was supposed to happen after four years? What, okay, what, what so was the guess or what, what were they thinking? Well, what Carney explained was that 
there would be an increase in in proportion to the sum of money realized. So uh, there was no time period. It was simply a matter of when when the monies were realized, they would be uh, paid out uh, anywhere between um, what they were re receiving in 1858 and and $4. And, He, he warned the Anishinaabe that as the ceded land had not yet been sold, they could not expect an increase until after the lands were sold. So what this, and those are his words. So what, what this suggests to me is that he's, he's at Sault Ste. Marie and there's very little going on in terms of land sales. Uh, and so, and whatever is coming in is, is just obvious, obviously to anyone, but not enough for augmentation. So uh, he's saying, you know, look, um, if the lands aren't sold, don't expect an increase because he knew that the only income that was coming was land sales, whether this was for lands for settlers sold at auction or whether it was lands for mining. Uh, don't expect an increase until after the lands were sold. And the only other thing I have to say about that uh, at this point, before I return to it again later in the report, is that this is sort of the, the first hint of an Anishinaabe view that the renewity would remain at the pre-augmented amount in the short term before increasing to the $4 per capita. There was no claim of anything beyond the $4 in their comments. And this is consistent with many of the petitions that we go through later in my report, which were read by the government and did not give the government the impression that the deal was anything beyond uh, $4 per capita. I have uh, one question, if I may, here. Sure. Mr. Marcello asked you, um, where did this four-year period come from? And I ask you, what, what is the source of the use of the word proportion? Where does that come from? And, and your answer to Mr. Marcello, well, um, you know, it's not necessarily known where it comes from, but there might have been some discussions. Sorry, Your Honor, where is the word proportion used? In the second bullet point. Second bullet, second it's bullet. in the quote. Oh, I see. Thank you. Well, I think, I mean, I don't know where it's, and the word comes from Carney himself, obviously, uh, that's its origin. But I think what he's trying to tell the Anishinaabe here is that um, the, the money that you're going to get um, will be in proportion to the proceeds. Well, I, I, I understand it comes from Carney, but do you know any other source for that concept? There's a proportional relationship. No. On slide 43, and you've already dealt with this because I asked you about it. Uh, the origin, you say the origin of the notion of a four year interval is uncertain. I don't think, unless you have more to say about it, we need to address that any further, Doctor. Yeah, um, so the, we also don't know what the origin of his next comment was, which is even more interesting. Um, 
Which one is that? Well, um, Carney advanced what I can only describe as a legal theory, which, and which sort of intimates that he himself has some kind of legal background. Because he advances this theory that the Anishinaabe had a quote, reversionary interest in the sales of the ceded lands, end quote. And that the government had a duty to sell these lands at, at prices which would be profitable to them. So this was like, um, th this appears to me like the sort of language of property law uh, as opposed to, you know, language of some layperson who's reading a treaty and opining on it. And it's, so to Kearney, um, he noticed, obviously, in the vicinity of Sault Ste. Marie, that no lands are being sold. And one of the reasons nothing's being sold is um, there were uh, some statutes in place by this time by which the government could give lands away for free if it so chose. And so under such a system, obviously the, the lands are not gonna be producing any revenue. If you're giving them away for free, they're literally have zero income. And so Carney, I guess, is reasoning in his mind that if the if the lands, if the proceeds from the lands are supposed to um, pay the augmentations, how is that possible if if there's no income from the lands? And and so he 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 places that in in. Um, opposition to the notion that the government had a duty to sell the lands, you know, at the, at the highest possible prices. Uh, and in doing so, he, he sort of confuses the, the, the system whereby reserve lands, for instance, were by uh, agreement, by signed agreement, to be disposed of by the government uh, to the best advantage of the indigenous peoples who had ceded those lands, right? That's not the way the Crown ever understood uh, lands that were ceded under these large treaties. They always understood those lands to be, once they were unencumbered by Indian title, they were now the crown was in a position to do with them whatever they pleased. There was no requirement that they be sold for, for the highest possible price. Uh, they could indeed be sold or, or given away for, for free if they wanted to. And of course, the mining regulations also indicate that, you know, the government was actually reducing the amount of money they were getting over time because, because just by a change of the rules. Well, did this reversionary interest concept uh, have legs or was it, a, was it an outlier? Did it, did it go anywhere? Well, well, it was definitely in, well, it wasn't. There's only a certain amount of leading that we should uh, work on here. Well, I thought he just said that this was contrary to the views of the crown in general, if I'm wrong. No, I mean, as I just said, um, the, the crown viewed any lands that were ceded under these treaties as being crown lands that could be disposed of in any way that the crown saw fit, including giving them away, away for free. And we're 27 years here, aren't we? Before the Supreme Court? decision when Carney's expressing his views of his? Well, it, it's, it's long before uh, then. Now, now, this notion of reversionary interest actually comes back uh, later on um, one more time. And it's the only two occasions that we find in the record, and they, and they both relate to the Garden River. 
that comes back when? Uh, well, I, I can't remember the exact date, but um, it, I refer to it later in my report, and it's in one of the slides that we'll see later. Sure. Um, finally, your last bullet there, please. Anything to add? No, it's just what I said. Uh, I've already covered mm -hmm. that. In slide 44, you say at the beginning, there was nothing in the RST or RHD intimating that the government had an obligation to sell the surrendered lands at a particular price on. What do you base that? Yeah, you compare the language of, of the Robinson treaties with, let's say, the language of those other agreements that involve the sale of reserve lands, and it, it's a striking difference. I mean, there, if the government uh, intends that its obligation is to sell the lands at, to the best advantage of the Indigenous peoples who sell them, then they say that, they stipulate that in the agreement itself. Right. It's a, it's a it's an obligation that that is part of the signed agreement. Um, you don't find that in any of the, the treaties. That you know the the the, the treaties. You know the, the pre eighteen fifty treaties, as well as the Robinson treaties, as well as the number treaties that came later, were all. Uh, Uh, understood by the crown to be in exchange for the extinguishment of Indian title, as it was known. Uh, and that extinguishment of Indian title uh, provided the crown with the ability to do whatever it wanted with the lands, with, with the, uh, you know, a few exceptions, of course, for example, you know, Indigenous peoples were usually in most of these treaties were allowed to continue their hunting and fishing mode of subsistence even on the land ceded. Uh, so you know there are there were exceptions like that, but but in terms of selling the lands, um, you know it, it was not like selling reserve lands. Right? This this was a a um, quite a different kind of of um, understanding, right? because re reserve lands, you're, it, it's they're more. It's more like um, like like selling the title, although it, it actually isn't. But it, it's more analogous to that. Whereas, you know, the Indian treaties that, that involved extinguishment of Indian title, uh, you know, had much broader implications for the crown. Carry on then and take us through, if you would, the Public Lands Act. Of yeah, that's that's the one that I was referring to earlier, uh, just moments ago. Um, that was the the act where whereby the governor could appropriate as grants to settlers any public lands in the province of Canada, uh, provided they were in the vicinity of public roads and, and didn't exceed 100 acres. Um, or the governor and council could fix the price per acre of public lands. Uh, and then, as we saw in, in the case of the mining, prices could be fixed by regulation. Right? The mining regulations fix the price per acre. It was the $100 and 400 acres? Yeah, was it, and, is that and an they example? Could, yeah, exactly. And they could change that from time to time, either up or down. Uh, and, and of course, after Confederation, Ontario also offered free grants of surveyed lands for settlers coming in. I mean, these are, these are all well known uh, in order to stimulate immigration. You know, various governments gave away lands for free. Once they're no longer encumbered by Indian title, as I said, the crown um, understood that they could be disposed of in any which way they please. 
We come now, Dr. Von Gurnett, to the uh, Sprague reports. Yes. Slide 45. So there is a transfer of responsibility, it seems, from the Indian Department. And we saw earlier there'd been a lateral request for information from the Indian Department to the Crown Lands Department. Now we have a transfer of responsibility going on, do we? Yes. So the Indian Department um, was now transferred to the civil service of the province of Canada. And it's at this point that the commissioner of Crown Lands, who at the time was William McDougall, became the, the chief superintendent of Indian affairs. So now you have the, the Crown Lands Department more much closer to the uh, Indian Department. And in fact, the Indian Department becoming um, kind of a, a, a part of the, of the Crown Lands Department. And uh, William Sprague was appointed the Deputy Super, uh, Superintendent General of Indian Affairs in, in 1862. Uh, Sprague is a very important figure in the history of, of the relations between Native peoples and the Crown uh, throughout this period. He had a, over 40 years in the civil service dealing specifically with Indian affairs. And, and uh, he, he, he knew a great deal about the Anishinaabe even before the Robinson treaties. So he represents a continuity in this whole, uh, in this entire story. In fact, he represents the continuity even after Confederation because he continued as in the same position uh, <coughs> for Canada after Confederation. He, he continued to be a sole servant for Canada. Well, he continued to be the Deputy Superintendent General of Indian Affairs. So he had a new responsibility. Um, you describe here in the last bullet? Yeah, he, he's, he's the top civil servant that, that runs the day-to-day -day operations of the department. And he is reporting to, the, to Commissioner McDougall, who of course is an elected official. Uh, but you know, the Deputy Superintendent General of Indian Affairs basically did all the work. Um, the, the commissioner was just a, you know, the guy who's ultimately uh, responsible. And he does a report in 1862 that you address uh, on slide 46. Yes. Tell us about that, please. Yeah, so the first report he, he made, like he becomes, uh, he, he attains this position in 1862. And the first thing he does is he, he sort of summarizes what's going on in his department. And so this is just an excerpt from, from his um, report. He says, the annuities to the various tribes and bands of Indians payable as the consideration for the cession of territory, as well as payment of interest upon monies held by the province, realized from the sale of land surrendered to the crown have been assumed by the government of this province. The annuity and interest money is distributed through the medium of the local superintendents at half yearly periods with the slight exception of the remote bands on Lakes Huron and Superior to whom the payments are made annually. And so what he's referring to here are the two different types of, <coughs> of compensation that I to right at the beginning of my testimony. And that is the, the difference between the annuity funds, which involved treaties providing for the, you know, these pre-specified annuities uh, in return for the surrender of Indian title. And then the land funds resulting from the agreements to relinquish you know, things like 
parts of reserves or entire reserves or, or, or smaller tracts of land and which involve no payments at all up front or, or, or no fixed annuities at all, but were tied to future proceeds or portions of proceeds or interest on the proceeds. And you address a table that he prepared at the beginning of the next slide, number 47. Yes. Now we'll, we'll go through the table, um, but why don't you give us the overview? Well, perhaps it's best just to put this, the table on the slide. Or we could put the table on the slides. Yeah, so because I, all I'm doing in the, in the previous slide is explaining how this works. So what you have here is you'll notice on the, um, the left-hand side is simply the name of the uh, Indian Affairs official who was in charge of the various superintendencies mm -hmm. related to the First Nations that are listed under name of tribe or account. And then you've got an amount of receipts and an amount of disbursements. And then you have under amount of receipts, you've got on land, timber, et cetera. And then you've got interest. And then you've got a, a, a column called on annuities. And then when you look down at, um, in the second column, down near the bottom, you'll see Ojibwas of Lake Huron and Ojibwas of Lake Superior. And you follow their, the row across and you'll notice that there's no amount whatsoever on land and timber, no interest on investments, but you do have the figures under annuities. So you have the 2,400 for Lake Huron and you've got the 2,000 for Lake Superior. And it, there's no interest on that indicated because those are basically, they come in, that they, they're, remember they're granted from the CRF, they come in and then they go out again. So it, they're, that's, that's sort of, the, that, that would become the zero balance. Although when you look at the receiver general's books, which is a different set of books, you'll always see that there's still a little bit left over every year and, the, and, and that actually accumulates interest as well because all of these accounts are, are actually um, supposed to generate interest. Was that from people not being able to pick up their payments or? Yes, there, there's various, you know, uh, reasons for, for there to be um, small numbers of, of dollars left over, which are then tacked on to the following year if they're not used. Um, so the point here is that it, this is sort of a continuation of the record keeping system where the annuities, the Robinson annuities are, are listed under annuities like all of the other annuities that you see in that column. And there's nothing in there specific to um, land or timber. Now, I draw your attention to sort of uh, almost halfway down in the second column under name of tribe or account, you'll see Chief Tatamane and his band. That's the Michipicotan um, RST leader, the Michipicotan band. You see that, Your Honor? No. Um, so then under name of tribe or account. Yes. You go down almost, but not quite halfway and you see Chief Tetomene and his band. Got it, thank you. Your Honor, if you go to the last bullet on slide 47, 
last vote on 47. You'll see some, I think, confirm, please, doctor, but yes, that's where I explain some, narr it. some yes. narrative there explaining that. Yeah, that's that's where I, I explain this. Thank you. So he had signed the RST, and under that, of course, he was entitled to a share, or his people were entitled to a share of the two thousand dollar annuity. Mm -hmm. But in 1855, uh, this chief on behalf of his band surrendered a mile square of his, or I should say a 640 acre portion of the reserve that had been, um, uh, that is part of the schedule to the RH, to the RST. You, you may recall there's a, there's a schedule at the end of the RST, which has a list of all the reserves. And so he, he and his people uh, had been given this reserve. And so in 1855, he surrendered a portion of that reserve. And so that First Nation benefited from the invested proceeds of that reserve. And that was entered separately, as you can see. So this was the system of, of accounting that um, continued when the Indian department was transferred to uh, the civil administration of the uh, United Province of Canada. So this document reflects what you describe as the sacred op obligation was that how you you put it earlier the obligation to pay the the uh, pre-augmented annuity that that's what's recorded or that's what's reflected in this document is, is that right well there's two things there's okay. what's documented here is the the obligation uh to provide the rst with the two thousand uh, dollar annuity right uh, plus uh, in the case of chief right Tatamane and his and his people there's a there's a, a an, an interest on investments of 5520 and that interest in investments would have been on uh, the sale of land uh, of reserve lands right. in 1855. And you described how that works yesterday. Yes. So if we go to slide 49, uh, can you tell me, uh, you say as proceeds from the lands in bullet one, as proceeds from the lands ceded under the Robinson treaties did not contribute to the annuity funds, they were not tracked by the Indian department. Now. The reason for this, I take it, is the CRF? Yes, that the 2000 for the RSD came from the CRF. And um, the so the so the Indian department itself was already um, had on its books the annual obligation. What it did, what it did not have, was the um, the tracking of of the actual proceeds from the lands that would have been necessary to um, determine whether the augmentation clause condition had been met. That was in the larger Department of Crown Lands because they had those records. The Indian Department only dealt with Indian Affairs, right. right? And as part of Indian Affairs, and this continued after Confederation, as part of Indian Affairs, you, need, you certainly needed to track how much was coming from the reserve lands. Yes. Right. That, was, that was part of the responsibility of Indian Affairs. But Indian Affairs was not in and of itself responsible for tracking uh, proceeds from Crown lands 
writ large, if you will. They're being done by another department yeah, still. They're, they're, they're being done by um, elsewhere in, in the Crown Lands uh, Department. And anything to add to this slide, Doctor? Well, Sprague's report also consistently year after year uh, showed the number of acres that had been surveyed. It's, he referred to them as surveyed surrendered Indian lands. And that's not to be confused with the Robinson Treaty lands as a whole. Those are lands that, that were sold as reserve lands and divided into townships and then sold per acre for an average value of 50 cents. So for example, the Michipicotan um, right. lands would have been surveyed and then um, they would have gone to auction and then there would, you know, whoever was interested would buy a section. Sorry about the 640 acre portion? Yeah, however, um, demand being very low, I mean, I tracked these over time uh, meticulously. I just went through every single year and tracked them. And, and what happened was a lot of these, land, these reserve lands, which had been surveyed and set up for auction, nobody wanted them. They remained unsold for decades. There was just no demand for them. And so the, the, the amounts that the First Nations received were relatively modest because um, you know, there was a problem selling land. So go to slide 50 and move on in time. gets reflected in these reports. <clears throat> yeah, so, so over time you have the, the um, not only the, the usual annuity payments um, for the, the RST and RHT, uh, but also uh, small amounts that were left over. Uh, as I said earlier, um, these balances were kept on the books and then added to the usual grants. The, the Receiver General's books uh, tended to be uh, more specific in that they always included these tiny little amounts that, that were left over. And, um, and then of course, from time to time, there were more of these separate entries like that Chief Totonome at Michipicotan. Uh, as other agreements came in, like there were agreements, for example, that involved timber leases on reserves. And so income from those timber leases, you know, the, the First Nation would, would sell uh, not the land itself, the reserve land itself, but rather only the timber that was upon it. And, and uh, so the proceeds from that uh, were then also added as a separate line in the accounting. So he, Sprague also included in, in um, he'd have a total amount of annuities and grants. They refer to as annuities and grants as opposed to proceeds and investments. And so by, the, by 1863, you know, he was providing the, the total amount every year. And in that year, it was $35,000 and $35,020. And so that included the 26,620 for the pre-1850 treaties, and then an additional 4,400 drawn from the CRF for the so-called new Indian annuities, and 
In addition to that, a $4,000 grant in favor of the Lower Canada Indians, who of course are in the province of, now in the province of Quebec. Uh, those would have been um, the Kanawake, uh, Kanasataki, uh, the Abnaki of St. Francis, and you know, all of those who were in Quebec. Now they didn't have any annuities because you know when the French came, when, when Jacques Cartier first arrived in 1535, there were St. Lawrence Iroquois in the St. Lawrence Valley, but they disappeared by the time Champlain arrived in 1603. And so the French entered what they regarded as, as a territory that was not claimed by any indigenous population. And they never undertook any treaties. There were no treaties at all in Quebec. Uh, and as a consequence, there were no uh, compensation amounts or annuities or anything of that sort. Um, and so there was a, a time then that, that um, it was decided that there would be this $4,000 grant given in favor of the, the Lower Canada Indians. The, the, the Lower Canada Indians of that time were on reserves these had originated as sort of uh, as, as grants to the missionaries, but for the sole use and purpose uh, and occupancy of, of the uh, Haudenosaunee or Algonquin or Wendat or Abnaki who were, um, who were living there. And, um, and they were in you know, a state of poverty, right? many other First Nations. And so this grant was established. And so that was added. So now you had three things. You had the, the 26,620 so for the pre-1850 uh, treaties. You had the, the 4,400 for the Robinson treaties, and you had the 4,000 for the Lower Canada Indians, as they were called. Those were the three things that, that were constituted the total amount of annuities and grants uh, for the years 1863. And that same amount you can trace over the years right into Confederation. We come now to Mr. McDougall on slide 51. I think you said he was an elected official, if memory serves me, am I right? Or am I wrong there? Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, he he becomes the new um, Crown Lands uh, Commissioner. And uh, just, I'm sorry. Yeah. So he, he he's the he's the new he 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 the new Crown Lands Commissioner uh, for the province of Upper Canada. And so he, as as I said earlier, the, the Crown Lands Commissioner had started writing annual reports in the in the mid 1850s and this tradition continued every year there was an annual report and I went through all of them and so I'm just giving sort of examples from various years and uh, so by the early 1860s um, you know these reports once again reflect all of the different you know, income and costs that went on uh, and initially Sprague who was the as I said earlier, the Deputy uh, Superintendent General of Indian Affairs, he had his own report, which was included in the Commissioner of Crown Lands report as appendices to the report. So it's a separate department, but you know, because they have the same uh, elected official who is responsible, um, the, the reports come in at the same time and are included uh, together. That's so, the first so, bullet, the first bullet here. Yeah, so, so, so McDougall's reports, as opposed to Sprague's, uh, detail all the proceeds from the lands, uh, including those derived from mining and forestry. And, um, you know, he, he, he talked about, you know, all the different mining regulations that came into effect. Um, 
there was a new mining regulation that came into effect in March of 1861. Um, but these made things even worse. So immediately the following year, there was another one, which in, for the first time imposed a royalty of two and a half percent. In 1862? Yeah, in, yes. But this was universally condemned uh, because it discouraged investment. It's always this balancing act. You know, the, the mining companies, of course, immediately protested and said, you know, we're doing bad enough. Now you want to impose a royalty on us. Um, so McDougal rep, you know, recommended its abolition. And of course, it, it, then in 1864, the regulations were changed again. Uh, and it was abolished, the royalty? Well, yeah, there was, I mean, there was, there were several new acts that were put in place, um, including an act solely for mining silver and gold, and those things didn't apply to copper mining, and it became more complicated, and it, it's a long story, but at the end of the day, the efforts to get this mining industry going in, in the RST and RHT territories um, still hadn't reached the point where the government was getting significant sources of revenue. Um, and the, the, the mining companies themselves were continuing to struggle right into the 18, 1860s. So, I mean, at, at the end of the day, where the, where the real money start, would start coming from was in timber. And we come to that on slide 52. Yeah, so starting in the 1860s, we're beginning to get better prospects. Now, the figures here are for the entire province of Canada, so um, uh, only a, a, a small portion of, of the, the 303,000 figure actually came for, from the, what's, what's called the Huron and Superior and Peninsula of Canada West Territory. So going back to our, our discussion earlier, Your Honor, um, here again, you know, it's difficult to match the figures because mm -hmm. they're, they, they're identified as coming from a territory that's not necessarily coincidental with the um, known or unknown uh, boundaries of the Robinson Treaties. And as I asked before, that presumes that it presumes that that was intentional. They either didn't know or didn't appreciate or couldn't keep distinct figures for the territory. Yeah, what it, what it indicates to me is that they were keeping meticulous track of income and costs, but not with the intention of illuminating the Robinson augmentation condition mm -hmm. and whether it Right. So there was also um, extensive reporting on the various colonization roads, uh, the system of providing free grants and, and so forth. Um, you know, there were some roads completed, especially in the RHT territory with, with at great cost. Um, uh, by, by 1859, and then they continued on these projects. So year after year, there were expenses for, for um, surveying and road construction. And then, so during the early 1860s, as we see on slide 53, land sales in the, in the province of Canada were actually decreasing year over year. And in the Algoma district, which is, you may hear reference to the Algoma district uh, from time to time. Um, in those days, Algoma district encompassed most of the RHD and RSD territories. It was a vast jurisdiction. Um, 
And, and of course, uh, you'll later hear about um, Dawson and Boron, who, who later represented the Algoma district in, in the uh, Parliament of Canada. So the price per acre in the Algoma district was only 20 cents, where is, whereas in the southern portions of Upper Canada, it was 70 cents. And that just reflects the difference in, in um, supply and demand and the quality of the lands for the purposes that, that those lands were used for. And the other problem that, that plagued this period was outstanding arrears for land sold. The government tended to be very lenient on purchasers that didn't collect. And, and after a while, it got quite overwhelmed with the number of petitioners who were trying to um, obtain reductions in the original price and the interest accrued on it. And Sprague identified very similar issues within his jurisdiction, which, which included reserve lands. So it's the same thing. I mean, you know, the, overall, there was a, there, there was a, a, a big problem with, with uh, selling lands uh, and, and getting income from them. Uh, for the government coffers. Finally, uh, Dr. Von Gernert, we move to slide 54 and back to the, uh, <clears throat> what you call the Indian Department tracking of proceeds. Yes. Uh, and these proceeds are, are proceeds generated by mining, forestry and sales of land to settlers. And you talk about that tracking in relation to the Robinson Treaty Augmentation Clause. Can you tell us about that, please? Yeah, again, the, 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 these kinds of records were there and they, they would have been useful um, to use to find out whether the Robinson Treaty Augmentation Clause had been met and there are hints that they were, and as I said, that later on Sprague hints that um, these, these calculations have been made. We don't know on what basis or what you know, boundaries they used for the RHT, but the, the point is, is that the tracking of these proceeds uh, was made, but um, there's no indication in the record, at least not in the, annual reports that the tracking was made specifically for the purposes of, of ascertainment of the condition of the, of the ascertaining whether or not the condition of the augmentation clause had been met. Does the purpose for which tracking took place, is it determinative of um, how it was used, how the information was used? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Crown Lands Department annual reports were intended to um, give the government a, a sense of what was going on with lands in terms of income and expenses in general. Right. It, it, it was never intended specifically for, you know, purpose of a particular treaty. So my, my, my only point is, is that these same records um, would have been useful for determining um, whether the augmentation clause would be met. And, and while there are hints that such calculations were made, we have no record um, that you know, gives us a spreadsheet showing you know, that, that that's exactly what they're doing until later on. Well, on slide 52, the $18,000 referred to in the second bullet, is that one of what you call the hints or? Sorry, uh, where? 52, 
yes. second bullet. <coughs> that yeah so i mean that's about as close as we get you know the huron and superior and peninsula of canada west but you know the way that's defined it's likely that it included more than the rht territories and rst territories um even if we apply the generous interpretation that the RHT went as far as the Ottawa River Valley or the Ottawa River itself, I should say. So let's finish with slide 54. Um, the tracking of the mining and forestry and land sales records. Uh, yes. Again, you come back to the CRF point. Yeah, so the, as I said, the Indian Department really didn't um, track this at all because they were mandated to ensure that the treaty annuities were being paid. Um, and in fact, the pre-augmented annuities were being paid from the CRF and not from any land or timber proceeds. The exceptions pertain to Indian reserves. So, you know, every time there was uh, something related to selling timber or lands, Indian reserve lands, that was tracked meticulously in the record uh, because that was considered to be an Indian affairs issue. And those monies would after deducting expenses be placed in an interest bearing account from which the interest would then be paid periodically to the first and nation. Another, is another branch uh, tracking revenues as well at this point or another? Well, the receiver Part general is, is, is also is tracking uh, all of this. Uh, so it is being tracked. Um, so you in, in, mul in multiple ways, how, you know, the, the, the question is, what is the purpose for it and what jurisdiction is responsible for tracking these things? So you finish with a couple of bullets, uh, I guess. We're getting into the time of Confederation here. Um, and why don't you just finish off with that carry through that you make about uh, authority over yeah, so this is a lead up into the, the next chapter, which which is what we won't deal with right now, but right. this is just a hint of what's coming. So since the Dominion of Canada uh, after Confederation had exclusive authority uh, on all matters relating to Indian reserves, um, these revenues were held in trust for the benefit of the First Nation. Uh, and the Indian Department kept track of the, of the proceeds. So this continued from pre-Confederation uh, province of Canada practices. All right. Whereas, the, you know, as we'll see, what happened at Confederation was then a split, a very formal and strong split between Indian affairs, which was under Canada's jurisdiction, and the Crown Lands Department, which, which in the case of Upper Canada, came into Ontario's jurisdiction. Your Honor, I think that is uh, it for my questions. I don't know if you have any on this section. If you want to take the lunch break now, that works. That works for you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, uh, one o'clock, um, 
This court will recess until 2.30.